Well, hey there, my friend. Welcome back to the show. I'm Deanna Yates, and you are listening to episode 197 of the Wannabe Clutter Free podcast. On today's episode, I am chatting with Dr. Christine Ko about her approach to minimalism. We dive into Decluttering with Sensitive Kids, her book, Minimalist Parenting, how she embraced micro decluttering, and so much more. There are some fun tangents too, so I think you'll really enjoy this episode. One of my favorite things is getting to connect with others who are also on this journey, and it is so great to learn from them, to see what's worked for them, or maybe get a new perspective on what it means to be clutter-free, or honestly, just getting some positive interaction and just feeling like you're doing the right thing or getting some motivation to continue. It's a lot of fun getting to connect with others. And so I am so happy that you are here and hopefully I can provide that for you as well. But before we get into our conversation, I do want to take a moment and just thank you, right? Say thank you to you so much for joining me. I know you are busy, so I am grateful that you are here. I do not take it lightly, and I hope you enjoy what you hear. And if you do, can you do me a quick favor and either share this episode with a friend, leave a rating or a review on Apple or Spotify, and just let me know how this is helping you so you can comment on the social channels as well. I just want to make sure that I am giving you the information you need so that you can actually tackle your goals and make progress in your life and let go of the stuff that is holding you back and keeping you stressed because I want you to be able to make time for what you love to do so that you can do what you love and you can have what you love without all the stress of being overwhelmed so that you can live that guilt-free life as the amazing person that you are. So thank you so much for helping me spread the word that you are amazing and you don't need more stuff to prove it. And speaking of amazing women, let's learn more about my guest this week. Christine Ko is a music and brain scientist turned multimedia creative. She spent a decade in academia, during which time she earned prestigious fellowships from National Institutes of Health to fund her PhD research at Queens University and joint appointment postdoctoral fellowships at Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Wow. Christine was about to become a professor when she decided to hang up her academic spurs in favor of more flexible and independent ventures. Since leaving academia in 2006, Christine has created a professional palette in which she wears multiple hats, all oriented around her passions for storytelling and problem solving, while also encouraging reflection, growth, and disruption. Give this episode a listen, and when you're done, head over to wannabeclutterfree.com slash 197 to get show notes for today's episode with links to Christine's website and some really amazing things she's got going on. She also has a podcast, so make sure you check that out. Again, you can find it all at wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash the number 197. And now let's get to our conversation. Well, hi, Christine. Welcome to Wannabe Clutter Free. How are you doing today? Hello, I am doing well, and I'm so thrilled we are finally connecting. It feels like it was a long time coming. I agree. I am so happy you are here, and we have so much we're going to dive into today. So I don't want to waste too much time, but please, first, before we get in, please tell people about yourself and how you help busy families. Let's see. The very short version is, in my previous life, I was a music and brain scientist. That's always the big surprise fact. And in 2006, I left academia to carve out a new life starting on the internet. And it has evolved to include things like a book and a couple podcasts and various things and a consulting career. And It might all seem a little sporadic when one sees it from a distance, but really, ultimately, all the work I do is really united by the fact that I've always wanted to help people solve problems, and especially families, (laughs) and just finding ways to help people anchor more deeply into what they believe and to let go of the clutter, be it emotional, physical, on the schedule. There are so many forms as that can get in the way of us doing the things that we really want to do. So that's been my mission through the many various platforms I've developed over the last 18 years. Oh, I love it. You're speaking my language. We have done so many different things as a family. We've lived so many different places. I've had so many different careers. I like to say that I'm like a book and every chapter is like a different either city I lived in or job I did or different things. And So I love it. I'm so on board with trying new things. And again, you said you have that kind of common thread throughout, and I just absolutely love that. So 
Walk us through your minimalist journey, though. Talk us through this a little bit. I do actually have your book. We'll talk about that in a second. It's called Minimalist Parenting. But what made you say enough is enough? What made you get on the minimalism train? Well, it's so interesting because, I mean, I really believe our histories inform everything and how we show up. So it is worth noting that I grew up in scarcity. I'm one of seven siblings, grew up with very little. It was a very wants, not needs household. So that's an important piece of the potential baggage I brought as a parent coming in. But I think as for stepping on to the minimalism journey, it was interesting because I started my parenting blog, Boston Mamas, was retired 2022, but I started it in 2006. And I kept having these glimmers of, in this world of modern parenting, where there's more stuff and there are more classes and there's more enrichment, I just felt like, wait a minute, I survived with way less than this. And also this just feels really overwhelming. And anytime I would sort of cast a stone out on the internet and say, I think we can do this a different way. I would literally get this flood of messages from people almost whispering. Imagine like an internet whisper, like, we, we, can we do that? Like, can we really do that? And so it just got me thinking and I just wanted to have more and more conversations about it. And I just kept, then I started speaking publicly at conferences about it and this do less strategy, which was very the opposite of what else was going on. And around that time, I connected with Asha Dornfest, who shared a very specific or similar lane of thinking. She had a blog at that time called Parent Hacks, and she was discovering the same thing, having those same little aha moments and whispers on the internet. And so when I had the idea for this book, I decided to ask her if she would write it with me. And she said yes. And then that really, that was like the official stake in the ground of we can do things together a different way, which was really exciting. It was interesting as I was reading your book. I now live in San Diego, but we did live in Chicago when our daughter was, she was enrolled in kindergarten there. We actually had, we left the States right before she started kindergarten, but we had gone through that enrollment process. And reading your book brought me back to that moment of, yes, there is a different philosophy on the East Coast. And I think it trickles over to Chicago not to the same extent of yeah, I can see why that would be so overwhelming. It felt very overwhelming with the enrolling into school and having to pick a school. It's not the same. In California, we're lucky. It's basically you go to your neighborhood school. And of course, there's still the privates and the charters that you can work into, but it's not the same. So I really felt connected to that journey as I was reading through different sections of the book thinking, yeah, I'm, I can see why that is a good starting point for we don't have to do it all and we don't have to put all this pressure on ourselves as parents, right? I think that's where it really came down to. I just I remember having conversations with my husband being like, my parents didn't go through this. There's no way my parents even had us. I mean, they might have had a passing thought of where I was going to go to school, but his parents definitely didn't. It was just the neighborhood school and that's where you went. And it was all tied into where you grew up and it wasn't this choice, right? There's so much choice today. And I think that's where minimalism comes in for me. But let's talk about the book real quick. There's a part in here, you cover a ton of topics, like all sorts of topics from the schooling that we just talked to and all those different extracurricular activities. You finish with some self-care stuff, which I thought was really great. But there's one part in there that I think just drove it home for me. And it was a part about your daughter and you guys were decluttering her stuffed animals. So can you... Ah, the stuffed animals. <laughs> yes, the stuffed animals. And I know that resonates with so many people, right? Because there is such an emotional tie to stuffed animals. So I know that's a tricky one. But can you walk us through that? Because it was just the essence of what it means to live with less. I loved that story so much. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors for today's episode. And when we come back, Christine will walk us through the story of when she and her daughter decluttered her stuffed animals for the first time. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you for all your kind words about the book and where it met you when you needed those messages. That's really like, that's everything for me. So it's so interesting, too, because I, I have two kids and Violet was born by the time that this book came into the world. But they are now... They're just so different. And my first daughter, Laurel, as a kid, she was very emotionally attached to her things. 
Violet, not so much, which was really interesting. But so the story you're referring to is, and one bit of an important context is that, as I mentioned, I didn't grow up with very much, uh, to put an actual concrete thing around it, I did not receive my first stuffed animal until I was five years old. And the only reason I received it was because I was in the hospital for a tonsillectomy. So there was really like the lens I have coming into parenting was just so different. So I've always had a little bit of like, oh my goodness, why do children have so many stuffed animals? (laughs) Anyway, back then, the stuffed animal situation, as I'm sure many of your listeners can identify with, was getting out of control. This was even before the era of Squishmallows. And I found a website that coordinates donations of gently used stuffed animals, which is a little tough to find sometimes. And so I brought it up with Laurel and she was initially quite distressed about this idea. That said, she's also a very empathic kid. We had done a number of like new toy drives at her preschool by that point. So she understood the concept of families in need and supporting the community and all that. And so she turned it over in her mind a little bit. She said, okay. And it was really interesting to just watch this process unfold. It only took maybe 10 or 15 minutes, but it was definitely easier when she could not remember who gifted her the stuffed animal. So that emotional attachment for some kids is really real and is something to keep in mind as you do your decluttering. In that short period of time, we had a landslide ready for donation. And the real money moment at the end, to which I think you're referring, is that she arranged them all artfully and in a very like thoughtful array. And then she chuckled and I asked her what was so funny. And she said, I'm actually, I didn't think I was going to be okay, but I'm really okay with all these ones that are moving on, all these animals. And you know what, mom, having less animals makes this little collection of mine feel so much more special. And I was like, mic drop. (laughs) It's the moment you hope for, but you could never plan for. So I felt very fortunate in that moment that she could really see that impact like so quickly. It was really cool. Hmm. Well, I think it's interesting. I, I love what you said there about it's the moment you hope for, but it's not the moment you can expect, right? We want to keep our expectations in check when we're doing these things with our families 100%. But I do think it's more often than not that you get closer to that realization than the other, right? I do think as you start to go through things, and of course, I'm a big proponent of doing your things first, making sure you have gone through the journey, make sure you understand what it's like. It's really hard to ask someone else to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. So I do think that's really important. But I think if you have gone through that and you've gotten rid of some things where you felt that moment of like, oh, am I going to be okay with this? It is easier than to help coach your children through that or help them through that struggle as well. And not being like you said, you let her lead it on her own timing. And that is, I think, what made it really come back around. So I just love that story. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I would tag on, and I know this is very aligned with the work that you do, is that like so many things in life, it's never going to be, okay, we're going to do one giant decluttering session and then done. It's all about these tiny, that was a 10 to 15 minute moment, right? It's all about these tiny little moments. It takes the pressure on them. It takes the pressure off of them if they don't go particularly well. Like, just remember, there's going to be a million more of those opportunities to just Try to make a little change one step at a time. Yes, good point. Good point. All right, let's pause for one more quick break and then we'll dive into micro decluttering and how that has changed Christine's approach to letting go. Let's get into that. Let's talk about those little habits because one thing you were talking about, and you actually encouraged me to do this as well, was these micro decluttering moments. What is micro decluttering to you and how have, what made you come upon that and how has it been working in life? Yeah, so it's so interesting. I started really leaning into this micro approach to like everything in my life early last year. I think I, I think my first episode of last year was called like identifying micro goals or something. I'm really into it. And now I'm seeing the term crop up everywhere. So maybe it was already there. I, who knows? Anyway, just to start, I think it's important to say that as much as I am appreciate her impact on the world. I am like not your KonMari person. I'm never going to be the person who empties the entire closet and starts from scratch. I just, it's overwhelming. It terrifies me. It triggers my allergies. It's like too much. (laughs) So that's an important first note. And I've also always been, especially in this part of my life where I've been doing the show and everything, really about tiny changes and small impacts because everybody is so overwhelmed 
time is at a premium. And like, who wants to spend their entire day doing some like menial task? Anyway, so I, my micro decluttering approach is all about really taking, breaking one project into really tiny steps. And I had another realization and evolution on this last year when I actually talked to a home organizer named Shira Gill. And she told me that when she meets with her clients to deal with their stuff, that the first step is as like, you can't organize your stuff. If you just have too much stuff, you have to figure out how to get rid of things first. She said on average, she and her clients, they work together and get rid of like 30 to 50% of their stuff before they even get to organizing it. And that number blew my mind. I guess it's not that surprising. And it blew my mind. And because I'm a former scientist mega nerd, I'm like, I like numbers. Like I like having a target to shoot for. So I, I did this little experiment that totally connected to my micro decluttering. And I was like, I want to try a 30 to 50% rule on certain categories and see how I do. And I literally was counting things. So the way to get micro, I'll give you a couple examples because that'll be helpful. But instead of saying, I'm going to clean out all my books, like that's like really daunting. So I decided to focus on my cookbooks. Like I had a number of cookbooks I've never used, or I've used once, or I had somebody gifted to me. And I was like, I'm going to shoot to try to get rid of 30 to 50% of this collection. And I went through that. I did in my closet. I couldn't deal with the whole closet. So I did handbags. I did shoes. I would literally count the number I had at the beginning and then count how many I needed to get rid of in order to hit my target. It was like super nerdy and super awesome. <laughs> and in the family vein, instead of uh, toys, because if you just say declutter 30 to 50% of your toys, it's just too overwhelming. I did board games and actually I had Violet, my younger one, help with that. And it was incredible. She, I think we donated like 21 board games or something. And she only wanted to hold on to like maybe seven or eight of them. I forget. It was pretty close to those numbers. It was incredible. So just getting really categorical about it makes it so much more doable. I did all of this 30, for, 30 to 50 percent decluttering in a really short period of time, got rid of a ton of stuff, donated a ton of stuff. And then the other little thing I do just for accountability is I use a to-do app and whatever organizational system you do can serve this purpose. But I just have a little reminder to myself every Sunday to consider tackling one tiny micro decluttering, when, whether it's something like this, whether it's getting rid of something on our everything is free city page, anything like that, just to try to like move something else that you no longer need onto a new home. Yeah. I heard your, yeah, I listened to your podcast episode where you talked about the 30 to 50%. And I also was like, you know what? I bet you I have stuff I could let go. Of. And the crazy thing is I talk about this all the time. I've done huge declutters. I still am constantly decluttering our home. I was talking to our neighbor the other day and she said something about like, but your home looks great. Cause I was, I walked into her house. And I was like, oh, you look like you've decluttered some things. Like I feel it feels fresher in this entryway. And she was like, oh my gosh, like, thank you for saying that. But no. And she was like, your house always feels like it doesn't have anything. And I said, it's because I'm constantly getting rid of stuff. I'm constantly going through and saying, oh yeah, we don't need that anymore. And just making more split second decisions in the moment, like you're saying on your Sunday moment of like, hey, do we really need this? Is this something we can let go of? Or is there something in my home I can let go of? And just having that moment, just that pause already set in your day or your week, right, can make such a big difference. Like we do a five minute tidy up every day and it's just a nice way to get the house tidy. But then it also, as you're putting all these things away, you start to be like, I've put, I've moved that thing five times because it's tidy up time, but I never use it. So maybe I can get rid of it. And it's just these moments of awareness, I think, is where the micro can really come in. And I absolutely just, yeah, love that approach. I had set my number for 25%. I got off of it a little bit in February. I needed a little bit of reset and me time in February. Our daughter's off school for an entire week. And kind of February is a crazy month. But I'm definitely looking to get back into it for the spring, which I think is now is a perfect time. This will be coming out in the spring and will be huh, that fresh start. Yeah. Yeah. The one other thing I think that's great. And I agree. It's like seasonal change is always such a good time to do things. And related to that, I would just also invite people to, you know, 
the act of getting rid of stuff, sometimes it really feels like a chore, but I think it also can be connected to joy. And I know that like this past winter, you know, winters in New England are no joke. You got to like find ways to pass the time. And so <laughs> I knew I was looking for ice skates for my daughter and they're, they can get expensive. And then I realized, I said, oh my gosh, I have three pairs of children's ice skates in the basement. I'm going to list these on everything is free. Two of them were the same size, which was so wild. I was like, how did I acquire that? I think I actually got them off the everything is free page before. And I immediately had two parents who snapped them up. And one was actually a parent of twins who needed those skates that were the same size. And so I had this dose of just like joy, like this is going to go to somebody who really needs it. It's going to save them money. I'm super pumped about that. I feel like that anytime I will list a bunch of art supplies or something for a teacher and a teacher picks them up. So if you think about some of those efforts as also like just a positive community build and a way to connect people to what they uh, need in the moment, like there's, it's, there's a real like happiness factor in there, which I think is really important and can make it actually fun to get rid of stuff. Yeah. Thank you for bringing it back to that. That is a, a beautiful point that definitely can get overlooked. But yes, we have a buy nothing group here. And I, I do. I love putting stuff out there on the porch. Our daughter helps me pick when we have a lot of people that want something. She helps me random generate the number. She loves that part of it. And, and it's nice, right? You just put it out on the porch. You let people know. And I feel I know a lot of people are like, isn't that dangerous? And I feel love our community here. So I feel very comfortable with that community. I know a lot of people in the group, but so I don't think so, but it works really well for us. <laughs> oh yeah. I don't even talk to anybody. I just leave it on the porch with a sticky with their name on it. It's like, it's beautiful. It's both community, but also then I don't have to, it's minimal peopling. So I'm like, this is perfect. <laughs> minimal peopling. I love it. Oh my gosh. There are days. I love doing things like this because I am a bit of an extrovert, but I can, I definitely need my time as well. Yes, I agree. Same. Yeah. Oh, so good. So good. Oh, gosh. What is one area that you micro to clutter that you were surprised about? Or are there anything that came up that you were like, oh, I didn't expect that? On the micro declutter side, I don't think there have been so many surprises, but I have found because I'm pretty aggressive and I'm not particularly nostalgic having not grown up with a lot of things, but I actually have found that the, probably the trickiest part of decluttering for me is that my practicality can then get in the way of me getting rid of something. So for, here's a great example. So in a previous life, I used to be a semi-professional violinist. That sounds very weird, but that was like something I did. So I have a crate, a very significant crate of sheet music from my recitals, my auditions. It's probably at list value. I mean, there's a lot of music in there and I feel like, oh, these books, like somebody could use these. And they are all marked up with my teachers and my markings. So technically, so there's where my practicality gets in the way because I feel like they should be useful because they are, it is music, it is printed music. Somebody might need that. It's hard to buy new things. But I really don't think they're actually that useful because a musician's markings are going to be all their own. So I will admit that creative music is still sitting in my basement and I got to, I, I think I just need to let go of it. But so th those moments when it's not exactly a nostalgic thing, but it's a sort of mismatch between practicality and reality, those can trip me up a little bit. Have you ever thought about digitizing them? Would you ever want to do that? Oh, that's an interesting idea. I don't think I will play. I'm not going to return to that particular lane because I think it's just challenging. I went from practicing two to three hours a day to then not. Like once I had kids, it's hard to come back from that. So I don't think I'll return to those pieces. I, don't, I definitely couldn't play them now. But I don't know. I might give it one last college try, as it were, and see, check in with the local high school and see if anybody is in need of sheet music just to play around with. And maybe I'll see if I can unload it that way. But otherwise, it should probably just be recycled. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Well, it's funny you say that, like the things you did before you had kids. We had our neighbors have rings hanging in their garage and like a rope. And the girls are really into it right now. So our daughter is 10. And she is so into like climbing and doing all the things. And so when I picked her up from a sleepover this weekend, they were like, she was like, I want to show you something. And so she showed me how 
she could pull herself up on the rings and like tuck her feet in and hang down and then like pull up and like sit in it. And I was like, do you know mommy used to do trapeze in Chicago? And she was like, what? And I was like, I've told you that before. I said, all right, I want to try this. So literally I got my butt up on those rings. And you were able to do it? Like did muscle memory kick in? It was not, it was not as graceful as I would have, have hoped, but it might have not been 10.0, but I'm sure it was pretty, probably pretty good. I got up there. I got my feet in the rings. I hung upside down. I, I have a pretty flexible back. This is a very weird conversation, but I can bend backwards. like hold my feet and bend backwards in like the basket. So I showed her how to do that. So then I got her up on the rings doing it. But it was just one of those moments. I'm just having this moment with you because you're saying, I don't think I could do it. It was pre-kids. You totally can if, but maybe you don't want to. That's fine too. Yeah. I mean, actually, it's very interesting because my mom, sorry, I know we're getting a little off track, but just, I think that getting rid of, I think people will love this. Yeah. Getting rid of stuff is also connected to like your history and everything. But my, the violin I owned was actually my mom's and she is like my model for creativity and curiosity in life. She's 86 years old and like, was like, I think I'm going to try to learn how to play that violin. So I had to get it all fixed up for her. And when I got it, all set up and I had to like take it to like a luthier to be like really fixed up and I tried playing it and I actually shared on Instagram a video of me playing putting hands on my violin for my first time in like 20 years or something and I could there was still muscle memory there which was really fascinating I couldn't play what I used to play but I just love that there's always something in all of us from our past that might pop out and surprise every now and then I love that you're able and I need to like live vicariously through your flexibility. I love that I know that about you now. <laughs> uh, interesting little tidbit. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. Um, but yeah, I do think that is, I think it's really fun to look back on the things we've done in our lives. And I do think stuff allows us to have those moments down memory lane and be able to relive the experiences. I know that really trips a lot of people up is that sentimental moment of like, but this reminds me of something. So having some way of being able to remind yourself of that, maybe you take your favorite piece and you frame it just and keep one, right? Just keep one piece of sheet music because it will still flood you with all the memories of that entire box of sheet music. Oh my gosh, that's a genius idea. I think I'm going to look through that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. How cool. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. But tell me a little bit more. I didn't actually have this. I didn't know this part about your story of the how you keep talking about not growing up with a lot, because I think that could also go opposite for people where they didn't grow up with a lot. And I have a, fa a, a family member that I feel like that is their MO is more they didn't grow up with a lot. So they don't ever want to let go of anything. I'm not going to say who they are because I've never asked their permission to share that part of the story. But I do feel like that I've seen that end of it. So it sounds interesting that you are OK letting go of things because you have the confidence that you can live with less. So why do you or maybe I did I get that right? I'm interested. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that the issues crop up in different ways. So while material things were not particularly my, the thing I hold on to, I would say that, and I do think this is a form of clutter, what I'm about to tell you, but I think the way that has shown up that my history has informed how cluttered my life is, <laughs> is that I was also a kid, I was the kind of kid who wanted to do everything. Like I, I wanted to do gymnastics. I wanted to do all these things. And we just, my parents couldn't afford that. I only started down the music path because of a free program in elementary school and then scholarships and to the music school and stuff like that. So the thing I wrestled with big time with my kids and more so my first kid, because the first kid is the testing ground, is that I wanted to sign her up for everything. Like I wanted to give her every opportunity. And because the universe is as it is, she didn't want to do a thing. So we finally, and it led to some issues like I felt like every child should know how to swim, which I still do believe that. But she wasn't ready for it when I was pushing it on her. And let me just tell you that nobody can learn how to swim when they are sobbing in the pool. So like from then on, from that moment on, I said to myself, I need to back off 
this is a form of clutter in our lives in that I've got these issues that are cramping our time in ways that don't even make sense. Like why sign somebody up for something they don't want? So our joke became every time she would come home from school with a flyer for this, that, or the other thing, we'd just go through. I'd ask if she wanted to do anything and she'd say, nope, nope. And I'd be like, great, I'm going to put these papers in the recycling now. <laughs> and she came to she came to her activities when she was ready, when she had the fire for them. And that's the time when a kid should capitalize on what they want to do anyway. So it was a definitely a process for me to let go. And so I guess that's the way my kind of scarcity fed into my parenting later on in life. So interesting. So interesting. I love how you said, and the way the universe works, she didn't want to do anything. Um, Because I agree with you on that on so many levels. But yeah, that's so interesting. And that is a challenge for so many parents because you see all these other parents that are putting their kids in everything and they're doing so many things. And you hear like, well, you need 10,000 hours to be an expert. And well, if my kid's going to be good at anything, they've got to start when they're in second grade. They're never going to make the high school team and all this kind of stuff, which just really, I love that you brought that up as a form of clutter because those expectations are, and it's so difficult. And you feel so guilty as a parent, but I think what you're saying is leaning into what the children want to do. It's going to be okay because they will eventually come to it when they're ready, if they want to. And you can't make someone swim when they're sobbing in a pool. So very interesting. Uh, Yeah, just not good. Not good. (laughs) Oh, man. Well, Christine, this has been wonderful. We've talked, we dove into topics we weren't even planning on. I love it. Yeah, that's how it goes. I love it. So much fun. Well, tell everyone where they can find you. Well, the easiest place since you have podcast listeners listening to this is my podcast is Edit Your Life. And you will be on my show very soon, which I'm excited about. And then my favorite social platform to hang out on is Instagram. I'm Dr. Christine Co. and edit your life show there. And then if any of your listeners like reading content, what's just different cognitive mediums, I write every week at Substack at christineco.substack.com. Oh, very cool. All right. Well, I'll have to check those out as well. I have listened to your podcast, which I already talked about, but I haven't checked out your Substack, so I will have to do that as well. But one of my favorite ways to wrap up every episode is with three rapid fire questions. So the first one is, what does clutter free mean to you? These are, this is a great question. So I think to me, it means being able to see and access all of your belongings. So it's funny. And also on the flip side, there's this quote that's not even in minimalist parenting. And it turned out I said it on like the Today Show or something. And it's the one quote to this day that keep circulating. Like that book was published like 11 years ago. But anyway, the quote is that I apparently said (laughs) is, think of yourself as a curator rather than a consumer. And this I still believe in really fiercely. I mean, you're the expert in this space, but I feel like in order to curb the the clutter, you have to think more mindfully about what you're bringing into your home. So clutter-free means both, you know, Uh, you know, minimizing what you have over time, but also being really mindful of what you bring in. So good. We're going to put that quote out on the, sorry, it's going to keep circulating because I'm going to put, post it for this episode. So apologies for that. Okay. I'm good with it. Yeah. (laughs) It's a great quote. Yeah. Well done. I, I fully agree. Number two, what is making you happy right now or in this season of your life? Yeah, that's a great question. Also, you know, last year I had this big transition, this big leap into uncertainty, a lot of chaos. And I think that right this second, my mind is so much less cluttered now. I just feel much more in a calm state and I'm just incredibly grateful. And also my two kids are very healthy and immersed in the things they care about, which is just a joy. That's like what a parent wants, right? You want to see them happy and doing their good things. Yeah, so true. So true. And then what is a goal you have for yourself this year? Yeah, so I just referenced I was in a very tumultuous state last year in transition. And so that was like half of the year that I was basically living in a dumpster fire and then half of the year spending coming out of it. So this year, I just want a calm and relatively balanced year, whatever balance means for busy working parents. But I still love work and I want to show up well in that domain, but I also am prioritizing the things that make us human, like rest and relationships and play and creativity and all of that stuff 
matters tremendously to how we show up in the world for ourselves and also in our relationships. So that's what I'm focusing on this year. That's so great. I'm going to have you back because we didn't even talk about your one month of radical rest, which I think is so amazing and terrifying, to be honest. I'm not going to lie. I you I reached out to you during that time and you got back to me and you said, look, I can't do this right now. I'm resting, which I am so just in awe of. So I've got to have you back because I've got to talk. It was shocking through like how you did that because that's a goal for me. I would love to. I'd be honored. It's yeah, it's great. Yeah, we're, we got to do it again. So awesome. Well, thank you so much, Christine, for coming on and we will chat again soon. All right. Take care. Thank you for having me. That was so much fun. I know we dove into a few topics that I hadn't planned on, and there is so much more that I wanted to chat with Christine about, like her radical month of rest, how she makes time for creative endeavors in her life, and more. So I will make sure that I have her back on the show so we can dive deeper. But I would love to hear your thoughts on the episode. What stuck out for you the most? Is there something else you want me to cover with her next time? I would love to know. So please come on over. You can comment on this post on Instagram or you can send me a DM. I am wannabe clutter free on the social channels. You can come on over to the wannabe minimalist group on Facebook. If you are on Facebook and you prefer to connect there in a more private setting and community, we will make sure we have a discussion thread for the episode and would love to chat with you in the comments. And you can also leave a review on Apple Podcasts, a comment on this episode on Spotify, or a comment on YouTube, and I can actually reply back to you there. And remember, if you know someone who could use a little help editing their life, go ahead and share this episode with them. It might just be the thing that they need today. Of course, special thanks to Christine for joining us on the show today and for sharing with us how she let go of clutter in various aspects of her life and what that journey has been like for her. I really appreciate learning from others and it was wonderful today. Remember, you can get more detailed show notes and all of her links by heading over to wannabeclutterfree.com slash 197. Again, that's wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash the number 197 to find out more about Christine. And of course, check out her podcast, Edit Your Life. As always, thank you to you for joining me today as well. With that, I hope you have an amazing day. I'll see you back here next week for a solo show. Until next time, take care, keep things simple, maybe give micro decluttering a try. And remember, no matter what, I believe in you. I'm Deanna Yates, and you've been listening to Wanna Be Clutter Free. I'll see you next week. Cheers.